It's going to be on advanced meshing techniques in ANSYS Workbench. My name is Eric Stamper, and I'll be going over today's demonstration and presentation. But just before we get going, um, just who we are. CAE Associates, we're an engineering consulting firm in Middlebury, Connecticut, specializing in FEA and CFD analysis. And in addition to that, um, for the past 30 years, we've been providing ANSYS training, technical support, and software sales. And this e-learning is one of many of our e-learnings that we offer. Uh, many of the past e-learnings that we've given are available on our web page as well as our, our YouTube channel. And you can find uh, the future e-learnings that we'll have on our web page as well. And if anyone's a New York or New Jersey resident and you want to earn continuing education credit for attending this, uh, you have to view the full webinar and complete the survey at the end that we'll email to you. And also available online, we have a bunch of uh, macros and scripts, presentations, and different case studies and things that we've posted up there, um, a lot of useful information that you can search for. There's quite a bit in there. If um, you're interested, you can check that out. And every week, we update our blog, which um, is just on some uh, you know, engineering topic that uh, whoever is posting that week is um, and write. So you can always check that out. That gets updated weekly. And if you're interested in any training, you can view our training calendar online and see all the classes we offer in our office. And starting this year, we're offering some online training classes as well. Um, so you can find those on there too. So then today's e-learning topic, like I said, advanced meshing. And there's uh, quite a lot of uh, things available in Workbench meshing. Uh, the things we'll cover today is going to be uh, things related to defeaturing, uh, generating brick elements, and then uh, some refinement that you can use to uh, better capture uh, you know, subsurface gradients and parts. So if, um, if you're interested, we do have a two-day uh, meshing class that covers basically everything that's available in mechanical. Um, and then we also have a, a four-hour online course as well if uh, you're interested in that. So um, you can find out when those are offered online on our webpage. So let's get going here. The um, first thing we'll talk about is defeaturing. And this is more specific to defeaturing in mechanical as opposed to defeaturing the, the CAD geometry in, in your CAD package. So one of the ways that you can do that is with uh, something called virtual topology. And it's useful for concatenating areas together or edges together. Because the traditional uh, patch conforming methods uh, that, that mesh your topology respect the bounds of the geometry. So if you have a lot of complicated uh, surfaces or lines and, and things like that, you're going to get a bunch of element edges on there. And if you're not concerned with things like that, then you can use virtual topology to, to group everything together so then the, the measure will respect the bounds of the new virtual cell that you've created. And you can do this manually or in an automated way in mechanical. That's with surfaces with edges. You can do the same thing. Um, a lot of times if you have complicated curvature, um, when the geometry imports, sometimes those splines that make up the, the curvature um, get broken up into a bunch of edges. Um, seen that um, sometimes too when you have uh, shared topology, uh, edges at the, the shared um, location sometimes get broken up. So you can turn on show vertices, and then you can see those edges that, that would come in. And if you wanted to clean those up, which uh, say traditionally you might want to do that because this is going to you know, maybe distort the mesh by having nodes at these locations, you can uh, use virtual topology again, but the, uh, the details of that you want to set it to edges only, and you can just right-click and generate the virtual cells, and it'll combine all the edges in the model. So if you had some really small edges that you didn't even know existed, if you did this, I would clean those up. Um, so that would you know, help you generate a nicer mesh. So that's one thing you can do with virtual topology. The, um, the virtual topology, though, it changes the, the surface uh, topology, the part. Uh, if you didn't want to do that, if you just wanted to simply mesh over whatever small features you had in the model, you can do this um, globally or uh, locally on parts, too. But what's shown here is doing, doing it globally, the details of mesh. There's a mesh-based defeaturing tolerance that you can set. So if you had some small features in the geometry, maybe some uh, small edge lengths, um, you know, that uh, you know, a couple of vertices and, and things like that, or a slivered surface, um, you know, traditionally that topology would get respected by any patch-conforming method. 
mesh method. Um, turning on mesh-based defeaturing, then it will, uh, you know, it'll mesh over those small geometries. So, again, this is just something that's useful if you have very small features that you're not concerned about to get uh, better elements in there. And a lot of times, this can help you get a, a mesh, whereas it would traditionally fail. So that was globally. If you want to do this more local to a, a body, you can do that. There's some different methods and different ways to do this, but what's shown here is with the, a tetrahedron mesh method. So if you were to apply a tet mesh to a geometry, which is shown on the left here, where we have some imprinted faces and we have some small little edges in here that form a little bit of a step, the patch conforming method will you know, respect the bounds of all that topology. But if you use a patch independent method, then you can mesh over uh, the topology based on uh, the different tolerances you can set and element sizes, and we'll do a little bit of this. But you can see then you fill in those regions where, if, again, if you're not concerned with that geometry, you can get a coarser mesh in the part by doing this. So if you put on a patch independent tap mesh, you can use something in the options there called mesh based defeaturing, again, though we just mentioned, but this is applied to the part that method scope to. So if you turn this off, mesh based defeaturing, and you mesh the part, you see that, that that sharp inside edge is respected. However, some of the circles are, are missing up here. So if you want to selectively um, maintain features, but then have uh, use some of these tolerances to mesh over everything else, you can do that. And the way to do that is to define a name selection before you mesh. It could also be a load or boundary condition, but you just need to define something on that geometry. And then the mesher will respect that. So in this case, even though we have a patch independent method and we're meshing over, you know, just these imprinted faces, we put a name selection on that one circle, and then that gets respected. You turn on the mesh based defeaturing, and then we can do things like mesh over that, that um, you know, step uh, cutout in, the, in there. It also meshes over the other uh, features, but th we're still preserving that one circle right there. Maybe we're putting a load or, you know, we need that in there for some reason. So whatever you want to preserve, you can just put a name selection on ahead of time and generate the mesh. There's also um, a mesh-based defeaturing uh, available, or really like a patch-independent type method uh, with multi-zone as well. And multi-zone is traditionally used for putting brick elements in more complicated geometry, but its default is to mesh over small features. So the left side here, we see that there's an imprinted face on this geometry, and the default is to mesh over that. So if we wanted to preserve that, we could just put a name selection on ahead of time, generate the mesh, and now that feature is preserved. That's the default method for this. If you wanted to preserve all the features on the topology, regardless of whether it had a load or boundary condition um, name selection on it, then there's a, an option, the multi-zone, which is the preserved boundaries. You could set that to all, and then it will preserve all topology. So we're preserving boundaries. In this case, protected is protected by a name selection or load, or we could protect everything, and it doesn't matter if we have a boundary condition on it. So those are some defeaturing options. Uh, so if we go to a geometry and you know see some of the things we just talked about. So this is uh, just a surface model, and we see that the the geometry has a bunch of surfaces that are broken up on here. We might want to try to group those together to get a nicer mesh um, on this surface. We won't happen to have all these elements in here that might not really do, be doing much for us, other than just adding to the element count. So if um, just get rid of that for now and use virtual topology that we said it can do this in an automated way you can right click and generate virtual cells and then it will fill in all the those small areas based on what's considered low behavior but uh, when we do that it um, it joins the, this is kind of a sharp curvature in some of the model here and it just gets grouped together in a large cell which that might not be what we want to do so I'll delete all those cells we just created. And you know, just like um, preserving things that we talked about with the mesh, we can do that with virtual topologies if you create a name selection ahead of time. So let's just go in here and grab say, all of those edges right there, grab maybe uh, all the edges through that part, and then grab those here. I'm just grabbing what surfaces that have high curvature to them. And I'm going to create a name selection 
on those surfaces. Just so now, it's not going to create a, a cell that is going to join the name selection to these other parts. It will preserve those name selections when we do the automatic virtual topology creation. And see so here, it, it did that. It, um, it created a couple cells here that were broken up. We could always go in afterwards and create a manual cell. Same thing, there's some edges here. We could you know, go and create these things manually, too, if we wanted to. So now we have some virtual cells. This is a little more simple topology. We generate the mesh on this. Now we're not going to see all these element divisions through here because it can mesh over the topology. So it's a little bit coarser of a mesh. But yet we still have, you know, those those sharper edges through there where there's some more curvature. So that would maybe better represent the, the surface. Whereas previously we could have an element that would, you know, go over this whole curvature and not uh, get it as nicely. And you could refine all this mesh and, you know, do things like that if you wanted to improve it. But that's just showing you a little bit with virtual topology. I have another geometry here, which is uh, a brake caliper, but it's a it's a casting. And a lot of times uh, with those type of parts, you have uh, a lot of curved surfaces that are coming together. You know, so we got the little slivered surfaces in here, and just things you know might not come in that nicely, just the way that it was created. So uh, we might want to try to mesh over some of those smaller features. So if we just look at what we have here, you can see that there's um, you know there are some small edges in here. Maybe we don't really need to have element it's, uh, following that. So if we go into the model here and just inspect what we have, so under mesh, there's sizing and defeaturing. Under sizing, it gives you the minimum edge length for um, you know the smallest feature out of everything that we have in mechanical right now. So somewhere in this model, there's something 2.6 e to the minus four, um, and you know there could be other smaller edge lengths in there. We might want to find those and see where they are. So an easy way to do that is just to use a name selection and then use the worksheet tab. So we can add, uh, let's say, add an edge with a sizing that's less than some small number here. Give it, um, you know, one thousandth and generate that. And then we say we picked up five edges. And it can find there's a little annotation label here just showing one of the, the edges. We can see that that's a small edge, and that's you know 2.6 to the minus four. So that's the smallest one that was showing up in here. And then there's some other ones. And if we look at this too, I had that edge highlighted. We can see that we don't have a node um, on this location. We have a node right here, and that's because the by default automatic mesh space defeaturing is on, and there's some de default defeaturing tolerance. Now this is a very small number relative to this part. So the defeaturing tolerance is a little bit larger than this length to be able to mesh over that. But you know that's that one's really small if I keep zooming out here. Um, there's one, and even this right here, which is quite a bit bigger, this down here is 60 to the minus three. Um, that's still pretty small for what we have. So maybe we want to mesh over that as well with this setting. So we could do that. We could put in something like 0.01 in there, and now if we generate the mesh on this part. Then it's going to mesh over that edge right there because you know that's larger than this length, and we can see that that did get meshed over right there. And now if I zoom out here, we can see there's um, kind of some strange things happening right at this location. If, um, if I look here, there's a, there's a couple edges, and then that that was a small, very small area that got meshed over, and maybe it didn't do the best job of putting elements in there, but it, it did mesh over that feature. If we wanted to try to straighten out some of those small little elements, which again we don't need in the model, we could do that in a different way with the patch independent method. It was one that we talked about. So put a method on this body, make it tetrahedron, patch independent, so it meshes over things. And there's a bunch of options there. I'm just turning off some of the things. So we'll just give this a general uh, element size. So <clears throat> the size of the, the circle there is the size of the elements that we're trying to more uniformly put around or put in this entire geometry. So, you know, it's going to start to mesh over small, smaller areas like what we have here and certainly uh, regions in here. So once that finishes, we should see that the mesh is going to be 
a lot more uniform than we had before where we had all those uh, individual elements applied in there. So you know, this is a way to make uh, the model have fewer elements mesh over a topology we might not be interested in. And there's quite a bit of uh, defeaturing that was done in here. I mean, maybe a little, a little too much. If you're interested in stress around some of these blends in here, then you know we're, we're not really respecting the bounds of the topology that great with this big of an element size. But if you were concerned about those locations, put a name selection on and then remesh it, and then it will preserve those. And then you, know, you could refine the elements and things. So you can selectively preserve what you want, and then everything else can be meshed coarsely. So you, know, you can always take care of those little regions if you're interested in that location. So I won't do that, but um, you know, it's something that could be done. So the next thing is we'll uh, talk about some brick meshing, and uh, specifically that multi-zone method again. Um, because that's a nice, convenient way to have geometry that we'll say is it's uh, complicated in terms of what a, a sweep mesh um, would need in order to be a, to perform a swept mesh, but it's sort of a topolog topologically simple in terms of what we might have for our, our parts. But um, you know, it'd be very difficult to sweep mesh this. So the multi-zone method just allows us to sweep mesh, sweep mesh a part like this without having to go in and slice it up manually uh, in your CAD system or design model or space claim. So these are one solid part um, in each case that get a brick mesh applied to them. So all that multi-zone is trying to do is it's trying to automate the process that you would do by slicing up or partitioning the geometry in your CAD system. So, you know, it takes um, or detects, you know, what the, the source and target faces would be and it performs the imprinting on those faces. And then it constructs the the 3D blocking that would get generated internally in here, you know, what you might do um, if you sliced <clears throat> this geometry apart. And then now this is all nice, uh, sweet, meshable geometry at this point. And if you had inflation applied, you can do that as well and still generate all brick elements. So that's what this algorithm is trying to do. So understanding, um, you know, what you would need to do to slice up the geometry is a, a good step in kind of figuring out what the, the code is trying to do for you automatically. So here's just some more examples of parts that with one multi-zone method, one body, you could get all bricks in them, you know, just trying to decompose the geometry into sweepable parts for you. So <clears throat> we can look at that and I'll use this geometry here, which it's not really that complicated in terms of what we have, but you know, you, you wouldn't be able to sweep mesh this part by itself. So because of that, <clears throat> you get uh, the tetrahedral elements on it, and the default is to use a patch conforming tetrahedral, which will respect the bounds of the topology. So we get element faces and element edges along this length um, of that line right there. And I, I put a, um, a slivered surface in here intentionally. So this, um, this multi-zone method, just, uh, if I insert it on the body, multi-zone, <clears throat> and generate the mesh on this Right now, we'll see here that you know it's going to go through and it's going to try to figure out how to automatically decompose the geometry into sweepable parts. But you know, it's it's not going to be able to to do it by default because we got this little slivered surface there. You know, it's going to try to take this surface, this surface, this one, you know, and sweep it through, take this mesh and, and sweep it down. But if it's going to take this mesh and sweep it down, you know, it, you got a side face here that's uh, triangular. So we need to do something to take care of that. The multi-zone method, um, I said by default, it performs in a patch independent way, but <clears throat> it only takes care of small little features in, in that way. We can uh, you know, manually control uh, some of the defeaturing a little better. So there's a minimum edge length. So on this multi-zone method that's scoped to this body, it's, the, it's finding that minimum edge somewhere. So that happens to be down at this location down here. It's, 0.15. So that's what we want to mesh over in this case. So we can turn on mesh based defeaturing, give it a value that's just a little bit larger than that, that small feature that we want to mesh over. And now when we generate the mesh, you can see that it, it can create all brick elements in here. You know, it's taking this top mesh and sweeping it down because it, it no longer had to respect that, that slivered surface. You know, it can mesh over that. So that's good. You know, it gets us all bricks reasonably quick. And now 
you know, what if we had some you know, higher stress uh, gradients that went into the part around this location or, you know, maybe around the bolt hole and things like that? Well, we might want to add some refinement. You know, this is pretty coarse right here. So if we want to capture a gradient that goes into this part, we might want to do some refinement into that volume. So something we could use to do that is something that's called inflation. And this is just um, a way to take basically the surface mesh, if it's applied to a 3D geometry, and extrude it into the volume. And it gets extruded some number of times and then some, you know, thickness, you know, different um, element extrusions are, are going to get it created there based on your uh, your controls. So you're going to set the size and number of uh, elements you want extruded in. But this works with 3D bricks and tets. And with the multi-zone method, you can see here that it also, you know, works in creating all bricks or primarily bricks, you know, around all this geometry. So this is great for capturing subsurface stress gradients that go into the part. Um, so that's a nice uh, way to refine. And this also works for surfaces. The surfaces could be 2D or 3D. So if you had some sheet metal part that had a, you know, a cutout in it and you wanted to locally refine around that surface, if you inflate, in this case, the edge, it takes that edge mesh and inflates it along the surface some number of times, some uh, depth based on the element size that you give it. And same thing in 2D. You know, it, it's going to refine into the, the surface. So that's inflation. We'll use that in a second. There's also uh, something called sphere of influence. This um, It doesn't have to be a sphere. It can be uh, geometry that you import. But what it is is you have some geometry in that body. You want to perform some refinement. So you put this, uh, this meshing control of sphere of influence in, and then anything, any of the elements that are in this volume inside that sphere get refined based on your settings. And th that sphere, like I said, could be a, uh, some geometry that you import um, and then refine that way. So if we do some of the refinement to this geometry, um, <clears throat> maybe start off with, we could um, you know, apply this inflation to some of the locations that might have higher stress around the bolt holes, these, these blends in here. So I'm just going to apply the inflation to this multi-zone method. <clears throat> now the surfaces in red get the inflation. And I like to define the first layer thickness um, and then the number of, of layers for the options for setting this up. So all this is going to do is on this geometry, the size of this circle is roughly the size of the, the element that it, the, mesh, um, the mesh face on the surface is going to get extruded in based on the size of that circle. So if we look at this now, we see that that's, uh, and it's kind of coarse through here, but you know we get some refinement into the, the surface. I mean, into the volume, and you might want to put in more elements in there, but I'm just trying to show you what this looks like. And same thing, we get some more elements refined into the volume through here. So that's nice, and this is also trying to keep all bricks in the model. So it's doing the transitioning it needs, it's doing the, the decomposition internally to brick out the sweepable bodies. So if we change the, um, you know, what surfaces get the inflation applied to them, you know, this time it's going to be all of these exterior surfaces through here. You know, then we'll see that, you know, we get the inflation all along the surface. You know, maybe the, the stress, you know, goes out farther than what we had before. But it looks like the inflation went away from this hole. You know, same thing around here. Um, it didn't. It's just the way that the inflation gets created around the surface. So you see that, you know, it, it gets extruded downward. And then, you know, it matches up in here. So the uh, transition is just done internally. Uh, so we got that, you know, uh, brick layer that is on the outside of all the <clears throat> the geometry. So now um, it's still kind of coarse around these these holes, bolt holes. If there was, um, you know, some stress in there, maybe we want to do some more refinement. We could uh, put a, a sizing on the body and use that sphere of influence that I just mentioned. And the sphere of influence, it takes a coordinate system. So we just need to provide that coordinate system or location where that sphere is going to be located. So just use that system, give it a, a radius for that size of that sphere. And then everything inside that sphere, inside of uh, this uh, volume, because that's what uh, that, that body sizing scope to, is going to get a more refined mesh. But we're still using multi-zone methods, so it's going to try to keep all bricks 
in here. So we see that it gets refined around the, the sphere. And then also, since um, you know, it needs to be refined through the thickness, it uh, you know, refines the thickness through this entire part. Um, but <clears throat> you know, it needs to do that because of the, the multi-zone method trying to keep all bricks in here. But we can also see a little bit nicer um, of what it's trying to do. So it's trying to take this surface mesh right here and then sweep it down through the volume. So you can see it, it creates a little division through here and sweeps it down. And then it performs the transitioning it needs to in this location because we don't have any other sizing controls over here. So it's trying to keep that coarse still. So it's uh, you know just acting locally over here. And of course, you know any of the other controls you want to put on, like a sizing on that blend, just to maybe make the element size look a little nicer right there. We could do that as well. So then, uh, you know, we get some better refinement around the, the blend, and then ref more refinement through here. So you can see that, you know, it's more refined through this location, but then it transitions around through here to be coarser. And it also is better shaped inward now um, into the volume. So, you know, you can control uh, the size of all these elements and, you know, make a better uh, <clears throat> mesh for predicting the stress in there. So that's, um, you know, some of the things with um, inflation. There's uh, another thing I just wanted to show you related to uh, meshing cylindrical parts. So this bolt. You know, get the tetrahedral mesh because by default it can't be sweepable. But we can certainly put the multi-zone method on it. And then when we generate the mesh, it's going to fit all bricks in here. So it, it's taking the, the bottom face right here, and then it's sweeping it through this entire volume. It's a little easier to see if we grab that surface and see. Taking that edge and then, you know, projecting it through to the top here and meshing this freely and then brick meshing that. So this pattern is the same as the pattern that's down here. All right, so <clears throat> maybe we want to inflate this surface so we can apply inflation to that and then give it um, you know, some height for this part. And then I'm just going to put in a couple elements to start with here just so we can see the type of inflation that gets done on a cylindrical surface. These will inflate two elements in and then it freely meshes inside this region, and then you know that gets projected up to the top. So if we um, if we wanted to make this a lot coarser, one way you can do that is um, applying a mapped face mesh to a circular face that has inflation and multi-zone applied to it. And when you do that, it's going to take this free mesh that's in here now, and it's going to perform an O-grid, which is basically trying to put in a square onto the circle right here. So we get a square mesh in here, and then at those edges of the square, it transitions outward. So because of the two layers of inflation, we get those two elements, and then it free meshes in here. So those are some pretty nice shaped elements in there. If we uh, maybe just bump the inflation down to, to one layer here, one layer before the, uh, the square. And then since we know that it's basically like slicing this into quarters, into a quarter wedge, we're going to get this type of a shape in, in each quarter. We can we can select all the edges and then just put a sizing on and just give it, um, you know, coarser divisions. So in this case, you know, we're going to have three divisions per each quarter. And we, when we generate the mesh this time, it's going to put in even a even coarser mesh. So um, this is getting pretty coarse at this point, but the elements are pretty nicely shaped. So this is um, if you have shafts or, you know, cylindrical uh, type geometry, this is a you know, a pretty quick way to get pretty coarse elements in here that are also pretty nicely shaped into that type of surface. Uh, so, you know, that's um, that's that with uh, multi-zone inflation, and that's uh, all the time we have for 